good to be at Calvary Baptist Church in Rockmart, Georgia. Is that what it's called, Rockmart? Rockmart. So good to be here, and appreciate you being here. And Brother Levi told me about the service last night, so you've had a good meeting. It's always good. And um, I, I tell you, though, when he shows up, it makes you hungry for him to show up again. Uh, that's just the way that it is. And uh, sometimes you come into a church service after coming on a high, and you want that to be duplicated. You want it to be replicated. Here's what I found out. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Thou hearest the sound thereof. Canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So as everyone's born of the Spirit. But you can't manipulate the Holy Spirit. You can't outmaneuver him. But boy, when he shows up, it sure is obvious. You can sure feel the wind blowing. And praise the Lord for that. And um, I pray that the next couple of nights, the Lord will help us speak to our hearts and give us some help tonight. First Kings chapter 5, would you find it? Thank you, Brother Levi, for... The opportunity, the invitation to come be again. I believe this is the third year in a row, and that's almost a record for me at anywhere. And so I, I appreciate you letting me come and um, been looking forward to it. And trust the Lord to meet with us here in these couple of days. I am praying for Brother Levi and his family, and it just seems like the Lord, the, the, just the devil, just fighting just as hard as he can. And so I am praying for him. 1 Kings chapter number 5, if you would, read a couple of verses, bring the message, been on my heart for a couple of days now. 1 Kings 5 and verse number 1. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard that they had anointed him king in the room of his father. For Hiram was ever a lover of David. And Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, Thou knowest how that David my father could not build an house unto the name of the Lord his God for the wars which were about him on every side until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God hath given me rest on every side so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. And behold, I purpose to build an house unto the name of the Lord my God as the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son, whom I will set upon thy throne in thy room, he shall build an house unto my name. First Kings chapter 5 and chapter 6 go together. And it's talking about building the temple, Solomon building the temple. Of course, you know that Solomon was the third king of Israel, was a great king, was a great builder. In fact, that's what he's known for most was his buildings. Chapter 5 and 6, he builds the temple. The next chapter, he builds his house. Uh, you remember the children of Israel, when they were in the wilderness wanderings, they had the tabernacle. The tabernacle was really a glorified tent, but that's where the children of Israel met God with. That was their meeting place. You understand that in Old Testament days, there wasn't a church on every street corner or even in every town. And so if you wanted to go to church, or if you wanted to worship God, offer sacrifices, there was one place to go. That was the tabernacle. And since Solomon got under the burden to build this temple, something more fitting for the Lord, and so he builds this temple. And uh, this would be the church, the church, not using it theologically, but using that term, it would be the church for Israel for the next 430 years. And, and, and um, it, it was, the, it was the, the greatest accomplishment of King Solomon. In fact, Queen of Sheba, she comes and sees it, the Bible says, that literally her breath was taken away. So chapter 5 and 6 is all about the construction of that temple. You read about timbers and silver and gold and workers. Seven years of construction, boy, what a building program that would be. Thousands and thousands of workers. And what it tells you is it takes a lot of work, and it takes a lot of workers to build a church. That's what's happening in those two chapters. Our church just celebrated our 43rd anniversary as a church. And in conjunction with that, I celebrated being there for 25 years, 25 years as pastor in May. And our church, um, they, they really surprised us with a video tribute and a lot of gifts and really went overboard on the thing, to be honest with you, and, and had, had a tribute and all of that. And, and we've got a great church. I wish you'd come visit sometime. Good music, good spirit. We have good preachers come through, and so every once in a while they hear even good preaching at our church, and, and uh, 
But we've got a good church, and, and, and when, when you go through an anniversary, some kind of landmark, it puts you in a reflective mood. You look back, but you also are looking forward. I, I know that I would, I would like to accomplish more in the next 25 years if the Lord tarries than I did in the previous 25 years. It makes you appreciate history, because sometimes over 25 years you forget who's been there, who has come through there, and things that have happened in the past that, that God did. I, I, I'm looking at Calvary Baptist Church. You've got a good history behind you. Brother Levi has told me about, about your past, and, and I just talked to the brother that came in 1980, 1980, 39 years ago, and, and, and you've got a good church. You may not be the biggest church in town, but over the years, over the years, there have been hundreds of, of decisions, eternal decisions that have been made in this very building. There have been people that have been saved, snatched from the jaws of hell on the way to heaven in this auditorium. There have been lives, that have been, there have been families that came in that were on the brink of divorce and they got some help in this building and it kept their marriage and their home together. In fact, some of you had your life changed in this building. You have sat in this auditorium, you have heard some truth from some preacher, and it touched your life. Even last night, even last night in this very building, you had a worship experience that is unusual in so many ways. And I, I say that you are blessed tonight to have a church where the Spirit has the liberty to come in and to move at His sovereign will and His pleasure you ought to be thankful for that. Amen. I have been to churches who are so full of trouble and backbiting. And to be honest with you, the pastor is just looking for a way to get out. The poison of gossip and slander has, has torn it all apart. And the services are dead and the altars are empty and nobody's getting saved. And it's hard to go to church when a spirit of defeatism has settled over the place. And you got to be thankful that defeatism is not here. I have been to many churches, and this really, this really grieves me, but I've been to many churches that in the past were an old-fashioned, old-time religion kind of church. Older pastor retires, a young man comes in, and he takes the church into a new, modern, liberal, contemporary, progressive way, and, and, and now they've got a huge crowd, but, but that's not the same as building a great church. When you substitute the power of God for something that is fluffy, something that is fake, something that is staged, something that is ginned up, and, and everybody comes to church casually and modesty has gone out the window and nobody can preach the Bible, you're not allowed to preach against any sin, you got to thank God that that is not here, that that's not here. You're blessed tonight to have a good church. Now, I know, I know that God builds the church. However, God uses people to build the church. What you have is not the work of a preacher. It is the work of the people. If you have any part here, if you put your tithes here, if you support missions here, if you lock the building up, if you clean the building, whatever you do, if you have a part, then you have a part in building Calvary Baptist Church. This wouldn't be here if you won't, weren't here, a church is simply a body of believers that are gathered for New Testament purposes. And the people of the church take on the character of the church, and the character of the church takes on the character of the people. In other words, the church is like the people that are in it. If everybody in your church is carnal, then you're going to have a carnal church. If everybody in your church is contemporary, you're going to have a contemporary church. If everybody in your church is a compromiser, you're going to have a compromising church. If everybody in your church is spiritual, then you're going to have a spiritual church. Now, I was thinking about our church and thinking about the blessings of God upon our church, and I, and I came to a passage that really spoke to my heart, and it's this passage about Solomon building the temple. Now, when we say that Solomon built the temple, you understand I don't believe that Solomon ever physically built the temple. In fact, he was the king. 
I doubt that he even got his hands dirty, all right? So it's not Solomon building the temple. Really, it is Solomon and the people that built the temple. What you read about in 1 Kings 5 and 6 are people whose names you don't know. People whose part you're not aware of. People who probably didn't think that they had a big part in the project and didn't realize that they were actually part of something that was very great. So it is Solomon and the people that built a great house of God. And what I find in this passage is a parallel. A parallel. That the kind of people that God used to build this church is the kind of people that God uses to build churches today. Here's what I want to do tonight. I want to draw a parallel, not a type. I want to draw a parallel. I'm simply saying that this is like this. The kind of people that it took to build this temple is the kind of people that it will take to build Calvary Baptist Church in Rockmark, Georgia. Here's the first one. Here's my first parallel. First of all, it takes people with a continual love of the Father. Look, if you would, in verse number 1, look with me. Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard that they had anointed him king in the room of his father. Look right here. Hiram is the king of Tyre. Tyre is way up on the far north of Israel. Tyre was a port city on the Mediterranean. It was a thriving commercial center. And Tyre was especially known for their timber, especially their cedar trees. What you read in this chapter is that Hiram... Sends gold, he sends silver, he sends a lot of timber, he sends a lot of workers. So he contributes a lot of material in the building project of this temple. Wait a minute. Hiram wasn't a Christian. Hiram didn't worship the God of Israel. So why would he donate so much material to build a temple he'll never worship in? Well, the answer is found in the last part of verse 1. For Hiram was ever a lover of David. You see, Hiram and David had developed a close relationship. And Hiram wants to help Solomon simply because he is the son of David. Can I say it like this? He loved the father... And since he loved the Father, he loved the Son. And since he loved the Son, he loved the temple. Can I tell you that for God to use you to build this church, it is going to take people who love the Father, people who love God. There, there's enough people that want to tear down, criticize, and sow discord. But I'm going to tell you something. If you love the Father, you will love the church. By the time that 1 Kings 5, 1 is written, David's been dead for a year. But Hiram still appreciates the friendship of David. And when he hears that Solomon's building this temple, he says, Look, I want to be involved because I remember your father. Your father was special to me. I, I loved your father and I, I want to help. Can I tell you that the greatest thing that you can do for Calvary Baptist Church is not love your pastor, though you should. The greatest thing you can do for this church is to love God. If you love the Father, you'll want to be here. You will want to be a part of what's happening here. If you love the Father, you'll love this place too. And when you begin to slip away and to, and to slide out, it's not because you don't love the church anymore, it's because you don't love the Father anymore. I think as Baptist preachers, sometimes we can get frustrated trying to get church people to live the way that we think that they should live. And if we're not careful, some of our preaching will turn into browbeating. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat these standards in you if it kills me. And I've done some of that, and that's not right. But you don't have to do that with people that love God. When, 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 when your service, when your surrender, when your separation, when your holiness truly comes from a heart that just loves God, it doesn't have to be beaten into you. It takes people with a continual love of the Father. 
There's a verse in 1 John 5 I've read many times and I've, and I've preached from it and I thought, boy, if there is ever a verse in the Bible that seems not to be true, it's this verse. It's 1 John 5 and verse 3. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Well, you know, I've met a lot of people that were grieved at the commandments. There have been times, Brother Levi, I've got up, I've just preached the commandments, just preaching the Bible. People get bowed up and mad and, and, and grieved and just ruined their whole week. I, I've met a lot of people that, that were grieved at his commandments. But there's a qualifier to the statement. The first verse, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God, everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. This is talking about those who believe in Christ, who love God, and who love Jesus Christ. And if you don't love God, you will find many of his commandments are truly grievous. But if you love the, hey, listen, if you love the Father, you could surrender to go to the mission field and you could burn your life out as a candle and you wouldn't be grieved at that. If you truly love the Father, you would have no problem with saying, hey, show me my errors, show me my ways, and commit your ways to just living by the book and it wouldn't be grievous to you. You could suffer shame and ridicule and scorn. You could even be persecuted for his name, and it would not be grievous. Do you love the Father tonight? How is your love for God? And by the way, by the way, if you know that in your heart that your love of the Father has grown cold, it's not because he did something wrong. The only reason why the love of the Father grows cold in our heart, the only reason why is because we decide to love something else beside the Father. When you allow another interest, another idea, another desire, another ambition, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him to the degree that you love this world will be the degree that you don't love the Father. I can say tonight, I can honestly say tonight that I love our church. But I love the Father. I love God, and I love His Son, and I love the church. It takes people with a continual love of the Father. Here's the second thing. What, what, what kind of people did it take to, to be able to build this church? It took people who have conquered the flesh. Look at verse 3. Thou knowest how that David my father could not build a house unto the name of the Lord his God for the wars which were about him on every side, until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. David wanted to build the temple of God. And God said, no. And here's the reason why. David was a man of war. For 40 years as king, it was one war after another. I think somebody counted nine major wars, but he's always fighting. He always had to fight another battle. And, and, and I'm, make, I'm making a parallel here. Do you know why God can't use some people to build his church? They're always fighting. They're always at war. They never conquer the flesh. They're either, they're either falling to sin or, or succumbing to temptation or falling to the next vice. And if that's not bad enough, they're at war with the sister or the brother somewhere in the church. And, and I know that we all have to fight against sin, but hey, listen, we ought to eventually get some victory over sin as well. If you, if, you are, if you keep fighting the same sin and the same temptation and you never get any victory in your life, you can't be used to build God's church. There are people tonight sitting in good churches all across America. And in their heart, they want God to use them. And maybe the church needs a Sunday school teacher. Or maybe we need a jail preacher. Maybe we need somebody that will work with the teenagers. And the pastor looks out over the congregation and he prays, Lord, who could I, who could I plug into that hole? Lord, Lord, who, who in our church could step up and, and to fill that role? And, and, and he would like to call, and, and you would like to, and, and they would like to. But here's what he knows. No, no, there's too many battles, and they're like, well, they're fighting too many things. And, and, and you can't take on ministry, and you can't take on 
leadership because you're either fighting a sin or you're fighting the flesh or you're fighting another sin and, and you got your spirit all crossed up and all twisted and you have a sin that you won't let go of it and there's a conviction that you're not strong in and, and so so I would like to use you but, but but you got too many battles in your life and you love God and you love the church but you got to have some victory in your life you, you've got to have some peace in your life. If you're still battling with the old sins that you've been battling for 20 and 30 years, you'll probably have to sit by the side and watch God work. But God can't use you like that. You've got to conquer the flesh. You've got to die to self. And you've got to get some victory over those carnal desires. Is it not true that the more God requires, God requires the, the more that God requires, the higher God takes you, the more that He requires of you? This level of surrender is sufficient for this level of service, but it is not enough to go higher. I had a young man in our church this year that surrendered to preach, just graduated from high school. Young guys surrender and preach are a dime a dozen. Whenever once in a while one surrenders and, you know, this kid really got it. And I believe that God will ask some things of that young man that he doesn't ask of every young man in that church. If you're going to be a preacher of the gospel, if you're going to give your life to the ministry, then it's, it's going to take a greater level of sacrifice. And I wonder tonight, I wonder tonight, I wonder what fleshly thing that you're holding on to that would make God pass you by when he needs another worker in the church, when he needs another Sunday school teacher. I don't want there to be any battles that robs me of the power of God. I don't want God to look at me and say, you're still fighting the same sin. You're still succumbing to the same temptations. You don't have any victory. You never conquered the flesh. I can't use you. David wants to be used, but he has bloody hands. And God says, you can't do this. How does God build a church? It's with people who have conquered the flesh. There's a third thing that I see in this passage. It takes people with a continual love of the Father. And it takes people who have conquered the flesh. Here's the third thing. It takes people who are committed to the pattern. Would you look at verse 5? And behold, I purpose to build a house unto the name of the Lord my God. Watch this. As the Lord spake unto David, my father. Do you know where the blueprints for the temple came from? It wasn't Solomon. It was David. David had the burden, and David had the vision for the temple. David actually drew the plans of the temple, and Solomon took the pattern of his father, and he built the temple according to that pattern. The blueprint, the plan, the way that we're going to do this comes from the father, and Solomon says, we're going to do it the way that my father would have built this. Listen. You can build a crowd with emotionalism and manipulation and rock music and girls gyrating on the platform, but you don't build a church with that. I, I tell you, I tell you that, that it takes the people who are satisfied with the pattern that was set by our fathers and they're not looking for something new, something trendy, something hip. I don't care how the church down the road does it, but just give me an old King James Bible that's good enough for me. I don't care what the church down the road does, but just let me sing the old hymns. That's good enough for me. I don't care how the church down the road does it, but just give me a preacher that'll stand up and just preach it hot and heavy without fear or favor of man. Just give me somebody like that. We have a generation of men who went before us and they, they laid the pattern out and they handed my generation a pattern. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to press it upon a younger generation that that pattern it still works today. And you don't need to get rid of the pulpit and get rid of the altar and get rid of Bible preaching and get rid of standards. And get rid of No, no, the pattern still works. It works. 
Hold your finger right here. Go to 1 Chronicles 28. 1 Chronicles 28. There's nothing wrong with the pattern. 1 Chronicles 28, and look at it in verse number 11. And David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch and of the houses thereof and of the treasuries thereof and of the upper chambers thereof and of the inner parlors thereof and the place of the mercy seat and the pattern of all that he had by the spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord and of all the chambers round about or the treasuries of the house of God and the treasuries of the dedicated things. David set Solomon down and said, hey, here's the blueprints and you're going to build a house of God one day, but this is how you're going to build it. I wonder where David got the pattern, by the way. Well, look at verse 19. All this, said David, the Lord may be understand in writing by his hand upon me, even all the works of this pattern. David said, this is not just my idea. This is what God has given me. And when you take something that, that's, that an older generation is giving you, and you take that heritage that you were given, and you build upon that, and I want to put it in the hearts of a younger generation, that that pattern is still good. I'm not interested in offending anybody tonight. There's too many churches that have found a different way. They've found a different pattern, a better way of doing things. And we like the contemporary music. And we're not going to divide over Bible translations. And, and we're not going to preach against sin. And we're not going to call things out. I'm going to tell you, you can build a lot of things with that, but you can't build that with this with that. I tell you, if you come to church tonight, and if you like having a preacher that studies and is not afraid to, 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 to preach to you and doesn't correct the Bible and always run into the Greek and Hebrew, if you like coming to church and knowing that your family is in a safe place, if you like it where the Spirit of God can move and you've got liberty to come to the altar and God can speak to you, there's a blueprint for that. There is a pattern for that. There is a plan for that. It takes people who says, I'm not worried. I'm not looking at what the other church does. I'm committed to the pattern. What does it take? I say it takes people who, are, who will contribute their service. Look back at 1 Kings 5. Look at verse 6. Now therefore command thou that they hew me cedar trees out of Lebanon. And my servants shall be with thy servants. And unto thee will I give hire for thy servants according to all that thou shalt appoint. For thou knowest that there is not among us any that can skill to hew timbers like unto the Sidonians. When you read about the building of the temple, boy, it takes a lot of material. It takes a lot of manpower. I, I think over 100,000 workers that had their hands on the project. And it took leadership, and it took organization, it took servants, and it took toiling and sweat and blood and tired backs and expended energies and wore out people. That's what it takes to build a church. And by the way, they didn't need everybody to do the same thing. If you're a stonemason, we don't need you to try to be an electrician. If you're skilled at carpentry, let somebody else lay the stones. And, and I say that, that it may not be necessarily something that you want to do, but if you're called upon to do it, then you just do what you're called upon. Your place is in knowing what you can do and what is needed to be done. I, I believe that so strongly. There, there is a philosophy that that I think independent Baptists have bought into it. And I, I'd be careful how, how I say this. I'm not against Christian college or Bible college. I, I went to one, and I'm not against that. But there, there, there seemed to be a trend in, in independent Baptist churches that said, all right, um, if we need a position, a staff person, then we've got to go to the Bible college and hire that guy to come and fill that. Here's what I believe. Here's a philosophy for you to think about. I believe that God treats this church like a body. It's a local body. And I believe that God has placed in this body everything that is needed for this body to do the work that he wants this body to do. I believe that. I, I, I believe that if this, church needs, if this church needs a song leader, brother, lead and sing. I don't think that the first thing to do is go out and hire some song leader. No. There's somebody sitting here that could step up and learn how to do that. If this church needs, needs a junior church worker or something, a children's church worker, right? There's somebody sitting here 
They may, they may, not, may not know how to. They may have never done this before. But there's somebody sitting here that, that, that could fill that role, that could do that ministry. They just got to step up to it, Brother Doug. At our church, um, we had a man in our church um, that worked on base as an HVAC guy. And so he did all of our HVAC work, and we had a bunch of old units. In fact, we replaced two this week while I was away. And so he did all of our HVAC work. Well, last year, he moved to Connecticut, took an assistant pastor position. So, so, so sitting in our church, I've got a plumber, I've got an electrician, we got a security guy. We didn't have an HVAC guy. Well, right after he had moved, right after he had moved, there was a pastor that called me from Kansas. He said, hey, I've been pastoring for so many years. I've just retired, resigned the church. We're getting away. We're moving to Milton. And they knew about our church. And, and he's asking, but he wanted to move to Milton and join our church and be out of our church. And, and so, so we were in the plans. And he was, he was moving to our place. And we never met. And so we had several conversations back and forth. And in one of the conversations, he said, oh, by the way, by the way, he said, my trade is I'm an HVAC guy. If you need any work, I said, I, I can do all of that. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that you can, sir. A lady in our church, her name is Kim Hannon. Kim Hannon is very gifted, very talented, artistic. She was our church pianist and um, uh, decorations, fall decorations and things like that. She was just very, very talented in that. And earlier this year in May, uh, her and her husband moved to San Diego, moved, moved away. And so I, we, we have pianists run out our ears, but, but I thought, man, who's going to do all these decorations? We have, you know, big flower arrangements and fall decorations and Christmas and all that kind of stuff. And man, who's going to do this? And, I, and I'm telling you the truth that right about the same time that they moved, there was a family that, that moved, a retired state trooper from Pennsylvania, that they'd come down and visited on vacation, liked it. He retired, and they moved to come to our church at the same time that Kim and Marcus moved. So here comes Brian and Donna Nor into the church, and um, they were there for a few weeks. And my wife told me one Sunday night, she said, by the way, you know what she does? I said, no. Well, she does interior decorating. <laughs> so the next time I saw her, I said, welcome to your new ministry. God brought you here for a reason. Here's what I'm saying to you. I don't think that you need to look outside the body. I think God has put in this body everything that's needed for this body to function and grow and to thrive. Now look at verse number 6. He says, he says, thou knowest, last part of the verse, thou knowest, there's not among us any that can skill to hew timber like unto the Zidonians. Here's what Solomon says. He says, there's nobody that can hew timber like the Sidonians. So in this particular area, there is someone that knows a little bit more than you know. And you have to be content to follow somebody else. You have to let someone else be good at something that you're not. You can't have the attitude, if I'm not in charge, I'm not going to be involved. You, you can't have the... You know, it's my way or the highway mentality. You have to be able to take orders. You have to submit to somebody else. You have to contribute where you are able. God uses people who are willing to wherever is needed to contribute their service. What kind of person does it take to build a church? I'll give you the last thing tonight. It takes people who will credit God for whatever is accomplished. Would you look at verse 7? It came to pass when Hiram heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be Solomon. It's not what he said, is it? No, blessed be the Lord this day. Hiram's not even a Christian, and he recognizes God's hand in this great work. You know, in chapter 8, in chapter 8 is the inaugural service in that temple. They bring the Ark of the Covenant, and when they, when they built that temple, they rebuilt all of the furniture in the tabernacle except the Ark of the Covenant. And when they bring that Ark of the Covenant in, the Bible says the glory of the Lord filled the house, and, and they couldn't see. 
And in chapter 8 is is Solomon's first recorded words in the temple. And I love it in verse number 12. Then spake Solomon, first words, first service, steps up to the pulpit, gets in the microphone. Here's the first thing he's going to say. The Lord. The Lord. He says in verse 15, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Don't you know that that day that there were people that came up and congratulated Solomon. Solomon, you did a great job. Solomon, And Solomon said, wait a minute, it's not me. The credit doesn't belong to me. The credit belongs to God. This house is not here because of me. This house is here because of the Lord. I didn't do this. I was just a vessel in the hand of God. Are you okay tonight if nobody ever calls your name? Is it okay if you serve and nobody notices? Would you be offended if you gave a large offering and nobody congratulated you? If you would be used of God to be a part of something great, you have to be willing to just let God have the glory. If you can say whatever happens, God did this. To God be the glory. I love the statement in Philippians 2 where it says he made himself of no reputation. From the Levi, I know a lot of Baptist preachers working real hard on their reputation. I think the promotion, self-promotion and fundamentalism has to make God sick. But I tell you, the kind of people God uses is the people who just have a continual love for the Father. Some people who have gotten some victory have conquered the flesh. The people who say, I'm not looking for something new and something here. I'm committed to the pattern. People who will say, preacher, what do you need? I, I'll contribute my service. And people who are humble enough to say whatever happens. God gets the glory. Are you that kind of person? Are you the kind of person that God could use to help build this church, to help take this thing into the next generation, your children and your grandchildren? Would you join hands with brother and sister and say, I want to be a part of what God is doing here. I want God to use me. Whatever gift God has given me, I want to be a part of building a great church. I'll show you one thing, and I'm, I'm done. Look, if you would, in verse number 8. 1 Kings 5, verse number 8. Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I have considered the things which thou sentest to me for, and I will do all thy desire concerning timber of cedar and concerning timber of Hiram said, I've considered all that you asked, and I will do everything that you ask me. Solomon evidently had gone to Hiram and had asked some things. And Hiram says, I've considered the request of the king, and I'll do everything that you ask. Would you be able to say to God, whatever you require, I'll do it. God may require of you something that he doesn't require of somebody else. But whatever it is, I'll do it. But look at verse number 9. My servants shall bring them down from Lebanon unto the sea. I will convey them by sea and floats unto the place that thou should appoint me. And will cause them to be discharged there and thou shalt receive them. And thou shalt accomplish my desire. In verse number 8, Hiram said, King... I'll do anything that you ask. In verse number 9, I ask one thing of you. I have one favor of you. What is it? In giving food to my household. All I want you to do is take care of my family. I, I don't need riches. I don't need you to name the building after me. But would you supply the needs of my household? Whatever you ask. Whatever you ask of me, I'll do it. But I ask you to do one thing for me. Would you bless my family? 
My reward tonight is not in pastoring a church. It's not in going out and preaching in churches. No. My reward tonight is that last night my son preached in my stead. My reward tonight is that all of my children are in church and they're saved and they're serving the Lord. And Lord, I'll do anything that you ask of me. Anything. But would you tonight, would you bless my home? Would you bless my children? Would you take care of my family? Would you bow your heads with me? you're part of a great church tonight, you ought to come tonight and say, Lord, thank you for my church. Thank you for my church. And I want to be the kind of person that God can use in whatever capacity. But I want to be the kind of person that God can use to build this church. Whatever God wants to do with this place, I want God to be able to use me. And Lord, Bless my family. Would you take care of my kids?